This is George Gilbert. We're here at uh, Databricks talking with Patrick Wendell, who is engineering vice president yes. at uh, uh, Databricks and leading the uh, Spark release process. Um, Patrick, let's let's get started on on the evolution of Spark's uh, most popular apps um, and how they change with the 2.x Spark 2.x features. Um, you did a or or Databricks did a survey last year, uh, last fall, where the most popular apps were business intelligence, data warehousing, recommendation engines, log processing, user fra facing services, fraud detection, security. Um, talk about how the capabilities that customers were building with those apps a year ago can change as they start applying the, the 2.x features, you know, like tungsten phase two, structured streams, data frames, I guess, which are pervasive, graph frames as they, as they start to, you know, move into the product. Yeah, gr great. So maybe I'll start by talking a little bit about how we <clears throat> approached the whole design of Spark 2.0. You know, how, how did we even get this feedback? What, what did we decide to work on? What, how did we think okay. about changing these applications? And uh, there's a few, a few ways we get input. One is that uh, Databricks is kind of the community steward in some ways of Spark. We, we started the project uh, several years ago at UC Berkeley, and we get a lot of feedback from the community through those tri channels. That's the survey that you're looking at right now. Okay. We had thousands of people tell us what, what did they like, what did they think could be improved. And we also, as a, a SaaS company, uh, operate Spark. So we're not only the developers of Spark, we actually operate a service with you know, thousands of users uh, using Spark every day. So we have a really interesting vantage point from which to kind of see what people are looking for, what they're doing with Spark, and, and where we can improve. Um, and, and we've spent a bunch of time kind of uh, in the last six to 12 months thinking like, what are, what are the main things we can really, really move the needle on in Spark 2.0? That's the release that's just shipped uh, now. And I think there was kind of two classes of use cases that we really tried to, to improve on. Um, and they, they kind of manifest in the list that, that you're looking at right now from that survey. Um, the first class I would describe as uh, kind of data warehousing style use cases. That was one of the, I think, number two on that list you have. Uh, but many of those could in some ways could be construed as, into, as data warehousing. Yeah, like um, business intelligence. Yeah, business intelligence is kind of in that same yeah. camp. And, uh, and there, the main feature request we had from users was they really want performance, performance, performance. Um, they're, they're trying to use Spark uh, to replace more specific um, kind of custom specialized tools, maybe even offload from an MPP database that's like a very mature system for doing kind of ad hoc SQL querying. So a major thrust in Spark 2.0 is around per performance for these kind of um, ad hoc query analyst type workloads. That kind of encapsulates both of the two uh, first two, two things you mentioned in that list. Um, and there it's a lot of, a, uh, I would say, sophisticated database optimization techniques. Can we take better advantage of the hardware? Can we avoid bottlenecks by doing things like code generation and other types of, uh, of sort of engineering techniques to keep this nice API that everyone likes but make everything way faster under the hood? So drilling down a little bit, that sounds like leveraging uh, some of the progress that's made in Tungsten so far to take advantage of sort of new hardware architectures. Absolutely. Like, you know, more and more cores, whether processor cores or GPU cores, um, uh, bigger, uh, bigger memory pools and with, you know, approaching storage class memory. Exactly. Um, so I think you, yeah. you really hit the nail on the head there. So, so the, the whole Tungsten initiative is really about getting closer to the hardware in some sense. Spark is written on the JVM. Uh, that's a slightly higher level abstraction. And what we're trying to do is eke every bit of performance out of the underlying hardware. And okay. the hardware trends, as you've observed, are more and more cores and more and more memory. The individual speed, of cores is not necessarily getting much faster. So it's much more about kind of having better parallelism and taking better advantage of the cycles within a given core. Uh, so those are that's kind of the data warehousing umbrella and and a bunch of kind of cross cutting improvements there in Spark 2.0. Um, I was I was saving this for uh, Michael, but it seems relevant now, which is then the the query engine itself has to you know is another important part of that. And um, from what I gather, there's uh, the composable there's a composable query engine where you can add rules, you know, almost like you know, you had slots in a hard in a hardware, which is, you know, Oracle will say, "Hey, we've been at this for 40 years. You know, just you know, don't 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 even pretend to mess with us." Yeah. How do you combine 
the the extensibility of the query engine and, and getting close to the hardware, does that give you a chance to leapfrog in some use cases? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think Michael will have all the details on that. I'll give a, a high level answer. Um, what we're really focused on in optimization is two things. One is the hardware. Can we just eke out as much performance in I.O. and, and query processing? Yeah. But another one is like, oh, I would say software optimization. So that's uh, having a logical optimizer that can sit there and say, you know, hold on, I've analyzed this query and we can actually avoid reading a whole segment of the data, speed up this query by 100x just by using some kind of deductive reasoning about what's happening inside of the query. And that's an area we've innovated in as well. And, and this optimizer we have, it's called Catalyst. It's the thing that powers uh, kind of the core optimization inside of Spark. That's uh, the result of Michael, who you'll meet uh, in a minute, his PhD thesis. That was his work on how do we build a more kind of composable optimizer. Can we have an optimizer that lets you plug in exactly, as you said, different rules? And it turns out that uh, that design, which is fairly novel, lets you uh, get quite a lot of performance while keeping the optimizer very simple. And you know, Spark is uh, is not a 20-year-old database. It's a young project with a handful of very bright engineers working on it. So mm -hmm. anything that can improve the efficiency of us making those queries faster is something that's a huge win for us. Now, you said um, the use case with the sort of data, data warehousing related workloads um, uh, includes sort of offloading from a MPP data warehouse. Um, from what I gather, two of the things that they do really well are query optimization and workload management at the same time. So balancing a lot of queries. Yep. Um, are you essentially trying to um, uh, workload, doing the two together is, is a, a difficult, you know, non-trivial task. Are you trying to take out um, big chunks of data because we have storage class memory, or we will, and then, um, you know, you, you sort of analyzing the data, that, that data set almost in isolation from, from what others are doing? Yeah, so that's a great uh, observation. There's really, um, there's kind of the multi-tenancy aspect in right. some ways. Like, you know, our customers may have hundreds or thousands of people trying to concurrently use Spark to, to do you know, queries in the traditional business intelligence data warehousing kind of model. And there, I think the most interesting aspect is that we're, Databricks is primarily a cloud service. So the way you think about um, multi-tenancy in that environment is really different because in a, in a traditional kind of a model, you have a fixed set of machines and that's not changing anytime soon. So what you're trying to do is, is as efficiently as possible let hundreds or thousands of users query all, the, uh, all that hardware. In the cloud world, the underlying hardware is elastic. Um, so it's, a, it's possible for our customers uh, and really anyone running Spark in the cloud, which is now the majority of, uh, of use cases for Spark, uh, to kind of elastically scale up their own um, instance of Spark independently of other business units, units inside of the company. So I think the, the way we think about multi-tenancy and performance is a lot more about um, allowing for elasticity and allowing for folks when they're willing to pay for it to acquire more resources. As opposed to the workload management. As opposed to the traditional workload management, which is like, hey, I have a box of machines and I've got to kind of bin pack as well as possible what's in there. So it's a whole different challenge in the cloud. And uh, in many ways, it's better for the end user, I think, because if they want more performance, they just add more machines and they can have them for a minute, for 10 minutes, for an hour, and then they can get rid of them if they want to. And um, I know we're not trying to sort of endorse any tools here, but I would imagine Tools that that um, that are designed to around that sort of multi-tenancy or, or essentially lack of multi-tenancy using elasticity um, would uh, one example be um, like a Zoom data um, or whereas like a um, a Tableau is more like take a snapshot out of the core database. And, and visualize that. Yeah, so I think that comparison is, is a, a good example. I think like the Spark problem is more at the data infrastructure layer, right. so actually executing queries. Zoom data and Tableau are more at the BI layer, but it's a similar analogy in that sense. I think like we're both focused on more kind of elasticity, plug and play, and a little bit less of a monolithic architecture. Okay. Yeah. okay. So I actually realized the second big, you know, maybe I can talk for a minute about yeah. the second big thing. So the first thing was data warehousing and, and making, you know, making that faster and easier and, and elastic and, and work really well. The, the second big uh, set of questions and requests we had from users is that we saw that, um, you know, c continuous kind of stream, stream style jobs were becoming much, much more common. I would say two or three years ago, 
uh, it was something you'd see here and there. And uh, now, like many, many more companies, both have uh, streaming data ingest. So they've set up like a Kafka or some other type of message broker where they have kind of streaming data coming in. Right. And they also have problems that they're thinking about in terms of kind of continuous delivery, uh, end-to-end delivery of that, uh, you know, either model serving or fraud detection or these types of things. So, um, so I think the second big theme, which I know you covered a lot with Matei, because uh, I was eavesdropping uh, earlier, is uh, how can we build better primitives for uh, thinking about applications in a continuous fashion um, instead of uh, instead of more of a static view of the world, like oh, we're just going to run a single you know job and, and we might run it every night or something. It's more of like an online, uh, real time kind of view. And and uh, this goes back to uh, I assume that old notion of. Um, what's now hidden underneath data frames, these mi micro batches. So it's like, um, let's incrementally update the stream. We can query a certain window of it live, or we can, um, uh, I don't know, you, you don't, you don't do online learning yet, do you? With uh... yeah, so that actually is a feature in in some of the newest releases of Spark. So okay. a great example is like um, a, a lot of our customers and Spark users in general are using Spark for um, some type of building of models. So they're using a model to describe whether messages is spam, or they're using a model to describe, um, you know, whether they think this customer is going to churn, or or whether you know, what ads they should show to which customers. They're building some type of mathematical model. And, uh, and a lot of times, uh, those models become more precise if you update them incrementally as new data is flowing in. Um, and uh, in some cases, that's actually the difference between a, a model that works really well and a model that doesn't. So starting in the newer releases of Spark, uh, we actually have support for kind of these incremental model building in uh, the machine learning library. But that under the hood is using the, the basic streaming support inside of Spark. So you know someone could have written that on their own, but we actually provide kind of built-in primitives for doing this in different places. OK, let me, let me drill down on that yeah. a little bit to make sure I understood it. Um, because I, I had understood that uh, with structured streaming, the use case of of um, online learning with the models was was actually not in 2.0, but was coming down in you know 2.1. Yeah, 2 I two, think the like the that. initial pieces of it are in 2.0, but it will be something that's evolved much more in the 2.x series. I think what's there now would be considered like a preview or beta of this of this feature. And you're also talking, I think, with Joseph Bradley potentially later yeah. today. He's the expert in this area, okay. so he can give you the roadmap and timelines. I, I keep asking, you know, I, <laughs> I, I keep getting a, a sort of dragged into, um, you guys are so good at explaining it, I, I, I can't hold off to the guy who's the expert. Well, we're, we're kind of a nerdy kind of, you know, group, so we like to get into the nitty gritty details. All right, let's put a pause right there, okay? Um, and and we'll come back and drill down. Um, this is George Gilbert. Uh, we're with uh, Patrick Wendell, and um, we're at DataBricks. This is the Cube on the ground.